Are you working in a job that sucks bows? Does your job suck and ergo your life? Do you want to change that because your life is sucking? Join the TBP Slack. Get a better job. Hello, everybody. Uh, you're tuned in to the best part of your week. Again, you know, I know it's the best part of my week. So I feel like it's the best part of your week, too, Jesse. Uh, I'm just speaking for the whole audience here. Like uh, he laughs because he knows it's true. But uh, today we have an interview. Today we're joined by Paul Hunter um, from Sigma Prime. How you doing, Paul? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm good, man. So a lot of people call you Optimus Prime. Is that is that true, or well, do you go by that moniker? Ollie Transformer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question we can't answer. That's something you find out in time. Yeah, we kind of are. I mean, biologically, but I don't want to get Jesse started. But um, no, uh, so so who who are you, Paul? Like, how did you tell us a little bit about your background and how you fell into crypto? And let's do let's let's go through the those motions of almost every crypto interview of all time. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. So, sure. well, uh, I'm a software developer. That's my background. Um, I started working in. Um, Kind of integrated uh, programming, which was a bunch of like doing uh, audio systems, so audio visual systems where you have uh, like say boardrooms um, up to operation command centers and war rooms and stuff like this, where you have you know a touch panel and then a bunch of screens, injectors, and motors to move them around, uh, and the touch panel controls that. So I was doing that for a while, uh, and then one of my friends, Adrian, uh, so he's also a co-founder of Sigma Prime, he got interested in Bitcoin, um, started buying some, playing around with it. Um, telling us about the math of it. Um, that was kind of the start of the journey. We were both, um, so myself, Adrian, Luke, and Mehdi, uh, co-founders of Sigma Prime. Um, Luke's since left. Um, we were all kind of just buzzing around the scene, just, you know, like dabbling and keeping our day jobs. And then we saw Ethereum launch in 2015, and that really, really got our interest. Um, being programmers, we were like, hey, look, you can, you can kind of write sort of programs natively on this. So... That took our interest. And then in Sydney, where we were living in Australia, we started going to the meetups, Sydney Ethereum meetups, and just kind of writing smart contracts, just, you know, following following random paths, trying to write an optimized cash mining algorithm and just, just kind of whatever popped up in front of us. And then we got a fair bit of interest and uh, this was kind of during, so this would have been in late 2016. So the, the ICO craze was kind of just starting to, just starting to ramp up. Uh, we started getting some interest in consulting and technical work, so we thought, you know, um, this stuff is pretty wild. It also seems kind of risky regulatory at the moment, so perhaps we should make a company, um, and then we can all sit behind that company. And that was how Sigma Prime started. So it started as a, uh, I guess, just a hobby um, for us, but pretty quickly ramped up. We started doing uh, smart contract auditing because a few of us have a background in information security. Well, all of us have. Um, a background in in getting up in things and breaking them, but a few of us had um, uh, a professional background as well. So, yeah, Sigma Prime really took off when the um, when the the smart contract audit started, and that's when I started. I moved into Ethereum full time. All of us moved into Ethereum full time. Um, so we're just like writing smart contracts, um, analyzing them, breaking them, popping things, um, and that's kind of how I got into into Ethereum really in in crypto. Um, and then that's how Sigma Prime started. And then uh, I guess we can, the next bit is probably how Lighthouse started. I'm not sure if we want to really want to go there yet. Or if it needs an introduction first. Yeah. So explain to me a little bit about what Lighthouse is. I, I, I basically don't know too much. Yeah, sure. So I guess uh, Lighthouse is an Ethereum 2 implementation. So it's, uh, mm. it's, a, it's a client, we call it. So I guess in the Bitcoin world, it's like Bitcoin Core. It's the you know, it's the software that is the, the fundamental base layer of, um, of Bitcoin. But um, in Ethereum 2, we have multiple implementations. Bitcoin has multiple as well. Parity did a Rust one, um, but it's a little bit more uh, centric around Bitcoin Core. But Ethereum 2 uh, is designed to be 
um, multi-client. So there's four different implementations. Um, mm -hmm. They all do the same thing. They're all supposed to, they all actually have to do the same thing. They all interrupt with each other. Uh, and Lighthouse is one of those. Um, we're one of the leading ones. We're pretty proud of that. And uh, we've been running since, uh, we, the project started in 2018 uh, and we were there for the F2 Beacon Chain launch in um, in December and we've run, been running pretty smoothly since that. So yeah, it, it, it started out of just um, kind of like Sigma Prime really. It started out of out of just uh, hobby interest in Ethereum proof of stake and um, just getting around and doing some, some open source contribution. And we saw the specification for Ethereum 2 land and thought, you know, let's Let's write this in Rust because, you know, it's a really strict language. It'll help us understand um, how this thing runs. And after a while, it kind of just evolved into an implementation and got funding from the Ethereum Foundation and a bunch of other places. And we've, we've picked up, um, I think the team must be, um, well, we've just added people. So it must be somewhere around eight or 10 um, people on a full time at the moment. So pretty exciting. You guys are growing. Okay. So somebody, one, one of you guys had like boatloads of Ethereum. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> to really be incentivized no like oh yeah yeah uh well, yeah we, we, we had a bit of ethereum so a few of us got in, in the crowd sale um and we did some mining and stuff like that um but i guess the real incentive for me is just the i really like proof of stake I, I like it as a security security property so i also like its power consumption so one of the big drivers for me to keep to keep playing in the ethereum space has been just the big upgrades that are coming for it and you know, jumping in there and making proof of stake happen. So maybe you can talk a little bit about um, upgrades that are coming because I, I'm, I'm for all intents and purposes, non-technical in the space. Um, but maybe you can speak to some of the upgrades that are coming to fix some of the gas issues that a lot of people are having with regards to using Ethereum. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So we, um, so I guess Ethereum has a few, um, a few fundamental limitations since it launched back in 2015. Um, I guess the, the, um, I mean, the core problems that Ethereum's always recognized that it has one is that it uses proof of work. Ethereum's never wanted to stay on proof of work. And then the other is that it, it um, that it's like single core. It's a single thread of execution. So every, every transaction has to be uh, processed one after each other. So this is like a, you know, a computer with a single core. It can only really do kind of like one stream of things at once. And it's kind of bound to be, um, only only really as compute heavy as one average computer is. So mm -hmm. these are kind of the two problems, proof of stake. Um, and then the other one is the, the like, we, we call it the, the problem sharding because the way that we can, can make Ethereum run on multiple computers at once, kind of spread out, be multiple cord on a solution for that, we call it the sharding. So they're the kind of the two big, big ticket items in Ethereum um, scaling. And I guess the gas uh, usage problems is, really um, a manifestation of this, this scaling one of, of Ethereum being limited to this one, um, like one, com one computer size, we call it one C of, uh, of, um, of computation. So there's some, a bunch of things that we can do on, on current Ethereum, kind of re revisionary things that we can just modify the current system, like EIP 1559 and, you know, start to start to play with those parameters to fix the gas. Um, but where Ethereum 2 really comes in um, to assist with gas is when we can get the Ethereum state and kind of spread it out across, say, 64 shards. And then we have um, you know, at least 64 times the, um, the transaction capacity to, to process um, transactions. And then the, the, the reduced demand, the less, less collisions, less, less um, uh, I forget the word, contention, less contention for space then um, then we should see gas prices drop as well. And then on top of that, because we'll redesign the system, we can make it a lot more friendly for layer two stuff. So we can we can start to get like multiples of those 64s worth of sharding. So we can you know, go up to thousands of times capacity. So so yeah, that's um, that, that's how we're looking at addressing these these gas problems in Ethereum in the, in the short term with things like EIP 1559 and then in the long term with things like sharding. Interesting, okay. So can you speak more to like, um, for a, for a non-technical person? So Lighthouse is, you said an implementation, um, of ETH 2.0. Yeah. So, so what does that actually mean? Can you maybe break it down a little bit further? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, I guess, two parts to, I guess, a blockchain from, from this perspective. One is the specification. 
Mm -hmm. And then the other is implementation. So the specification is, you know, like a set of blueprints and, and a bunch of things saying, you know, it should do this, it should process blocks, it should reject blocks with this condition. So we have this specification of what should happen. And we have the implementation, which is someone who comes along, someone like me comes along and looks at that specification and says, you know, I'm going to get this with a programming language and turn it into a computer program that you can run. And it needs to obey all of these um, specifications. So in Ethereum 2, uh, it was specified by, I guess, initially by Vitalik Buterin. He wrote the first um, kind of document describing how he thinks F2 should work. And then from then, it's been refined and refined and kind of moved around. And now it lives in... Um, in a in a repository, GitHub repository called uh, Ethereum forward slash S two point hyphen specs, and there is all of the state transition logic rules about block validity, which like who how to become a validator, like how they should sign things, all of this kind of stuff that everybody needs to obey to, so mm -hmm. a, bit, a bit like the the Bitcoin um, white paper, but but like very detailed. I'm not sure. I don't follow Bitcoin so closely. I'm not sure if it has an exact um specification like this i think it tends to to use reference implementations a bit more but ethereum too because it was designed to be multi-implementation um like from, from the set out it's really got this clear definition between the spec which is which is where everything is defined and the implementations which all in, implement it so um there's i guess four primary like active running implementations of f2 now there's lighthouse which is what i work on there's prism there's Nimbus, um, and then there's Teku. So Prism's in Go, Nimbus is in Nim, a fairly new, cool Python-esque programming language, and Teku is in Java. So they all implement the, uh, the, the specification, and then we all interact together, and hopefully we all agree on things. So one of the risks with this multi-client stuff is that you have a bug in one of the implementations. Um, and perhaps if you only had one implementation, then, you know, that if that bug isn't too bad, then we say, okay, that's part of the protocol now. Um, whether that's good or bad is, is, is another thing. But when we have multiple implementations, there's none of that. You know, if anyone ever deviates from the spec, then, then we're all in trouble. So one of the other things we do at Sigma Prime uh, is a thing called fuzzing, where we um, have these uh, programs that um, we hook all the different clients into, into this like, kind of harness, a fuzzing harness, we call it. And then we um, just spray random input, like kind of structured random input at all of the clients. So we spray a block at them and then we see, did they all agree on the same, did they all agree on whether that block was valid? Did they all behave in the same way? Um, and we also kind of read the code, like we have instruments in, in the code to detect how much of the program we triggered with that block. And then the, our smart fuzzing thing will then like try and mutate that block a little bit, throw it to them again, see if it's a difference, see if it explored more code paths um, and then just repeats that, you know, at just, you know, like hashing kind of speeds, which is like, you know, thousands and millions of times a second. We just constantly spray and put all these different implementations uh, and see if we can get them to explode or do anything weird. Um, so you're looking yeah. for some sort of edge cases that like break one of the implementations. Yeah, exactly right. And we found a bunch of them actually. I think maybe 30 plus um, mm -hmm. our fuzzers found. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of one of the ways that we make sure we, we keep all the implementations honest and, and working together. How, how does that... I guess how do how do they intercommunicate when they're all in different languages? How does that is it just because they're all at the end of the day just submitting blocks? Yeah, that's right. We have a it's it's called SSZ simple serialized. We have this format which is what we use to send objects like blocks over the network, uh, and everyone agrees upon this format. So I can like turn it into like serialize it just into just like just a bunch of bytes that go over you know a cable across the Tasman or whatever, and then. Um, and then the other implementation can pick it up and then they deserialize it into whatever kind of programming language specific stuff they're doing. Okay. So there is some sort of universal um, transmission of information. So you said it was SS what again? SSC, simple serialized. SSC, okay. Hmm. Yeah. So they, oh. they um, we've had a lot of uh, bugs in that one as well with, the, with that. And interestingly, just because any, any decoding format, um, so that's one of the things I've has played a lot around with. Is as I said, just trying to get to build the as I said like uh, byte strings that mm -hmm. behave differently on different programs. So that's that's been a great attack vector for us. Um, we a lot of problems there. What kind of edge cases uh, are you guys finding? Like, are they any? Uh, are there? Are there any um, serious like edge cases that result in? Um, I guess 
what what would be like huge issues i guess with like uh to like value being lost i guess out of a smart contract somehow that yeah, would probably be well, a huge vulnerability yeah totally well we we um there are, in, in the multi-client um because we have multiple implementations it's a little bit harder for like one exploit to to say like ruin a smart contract or something what mm -hmm. we can usually do with those and what our fuzzing usually finds is places where we can um get one of the implementations to to maybe go off and, and to think something is valid and everything else thinks it's invalid. So we call that forking um, and kind of an overloaded term in this industry now, but we call that just like making an implementation go off on a fork. That's one way that we can we can detect that, you know, it's it's routines are invalid. Um, another one is one we get a fair bit is just a, we can get it to the program to crash and just say like either um, it's trying to, it gets a block, it tries to, to deserialize it, but then it can't. So it kind of crashes, maybe doesn't crash so elegantly and falls into a little bit of a weird state. And then might, we might be able to leverage that weird state to, to get it to stop following blocks or something like this. So kind of a class of exploits that we're trying to basically take the node offline. So if we can find, you know, one of these things where we can just hammer out and take a bunch of nodes offline all at once, and we can cause chaos in the network and that might, you know, leverage for another type of attack or something. Um, and then the absolute worst class of these, these problems is um, remote code execution. We haven't found anything close to this um, with any of our F implementations um, because this protocol doesn't lend itself too much, but basically it's had a lot of problems with this with XML and Java and stuff like this, where you can, you can be like on the network, you'd be like, Hey, here's, here's, here's a packet. And then it, it reads it. And then through a bunch of fancy trickery, you can basically get it to, to think that what is in this piece of like th this, these bytes you sent over the network is actually code that it should execute. So then now you're basically in charge of this computer. You can steal secrets. You can, you know, like do, do kind of all sorts of anything with it. Um, so that's the absolute worst class, but we, we haven't come close to, to that with this, but, and we did we did find a lot of the other ones, a lot of crash um, scenarios early on in development, um, but that's kind of expected. Like you know, we're, we're building software. We needed we needed analysis, and we haven't. I don't think we found any SSZ stuff since we since, since we hit production. So so the way that this could like work practically. So if I'm running like an ETH2 validator node with 32 ETH staked, then uh, I'm using your implementation of Lighthouse. Um, somebody could, I guess send packets of information to uh my node i guess and then crash it yeah that's right that's the i mean that's that's my my biggest fear when when i'm mm -hmm. running the software and then when i'm the guy trying to find exploits that's my that's my dream so um so yeah that's, how do you get that's into that like how do you how is that how does that become your dream job i'm just out of curiosity well i mean for us i guess uh it happened well, I guess it all, it started for me, uh, I think Adrian as well, back in high school, the, um, we went to, grew up in a place in Newcastle, which is like a couple of hours north of Sydney. Um, and there wasn't really much going on in the computer curriculum uh, when we were there. So we ended up kind of, I guess, getting into our computer uh, networks. It's, it's um, I guess it's like not, not not super legal it's a, it's a different world we are today but um yeah we ended up you know just getting in there kind of as kids do just getting up in there learning exploring the network you know breaking passwords um and and just fiddling around and i guess that was kind of the first time for me that i'd ever really got into the mindset of you know like changing from like you know a computer is what i is like I'm, i need it to do things for me to, to be like all right i'm gonna try and do things to it that it doesn't expect me to do um, and then I guess from there, we kind of, like, I went my own way, it was developing. And then once we got back into smart contract security again, that's when we kind of got into that frame of mind of, you know, like, all right, here's a smart contract. What, what, are, what, are, what are the assumptions that the developers are making? Like, what can I do to it? How can I like, you know, if I pull on this bit, it bends, which means I can like, you know, pull on this bit and that bends too. And then there's some stress over here and I can snap that bit. Um, so you kind of link all these things together. So. Yeah, that's um. That, you, I, that, I assume that, you've seen the Matrix, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you guys are like, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because I I I see you guys as like um, what was the dude, the two brothers who like they used to man the mainframe and then they just like they would see the code as like you know something that they it, it was it was all tangibly understandable to them, you know? 
And then like, yeah, if I, yeah. like the way you say that, if I pull on this, if I bend this, and then if I bend this too, I'll get some, you know, potentially predictable result that may change the system status in such a way that, you know, I can, I can um, exploit that or something. It's just yeah, yeah. Cable. Cable was his name. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm terrible with names, but yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of like that, I guess. Um, but much much less dramatic and exciting um, day to day, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, we've kind of got that in in the company, really. That that kind of vibe. We've got the infosec side of us as well, the Ethereum two side. So that's something that when we're building the F two stuff, that we've always we kind of have that mindset of um, you know, like you you really need to like when you write something, you really need to be just like super strict about it. You need to really um like limit all of the kind of edge cases like make sure that all the behavior is is it's like really well defined what you'll do if you do have an error things like this um so that's that's one of the things that we try and bring to i guess our implementation and f2 in general is that kind of attackers mindset interesting well uh let's see what else about sigma prime have we not gone over or about uh the lighthouse implementation that maybe you want to talk about yeah, well, like Sigma Prime does, uh, so it does a bunch of stuff for Ethereum um, F2, um, but it also does a bunch of stuff for uh, smart contract reviews and other protocol reviews, like uh, we've got what is near protocol, we've got Filecoin um, reviewing their implementations as well. So there's a whole other side which um, I don't get onto so much because I'm, I'm pretty well I have to focus, but we're out there and, you know, having a go at, at other people's um, implementations always, you know, with. Um, with that consent and with best practices in terms of, you know, revealing vulnerabilities and, and not breaking things um, that are important. Um, so, yeah, we, we get up to a fair bit of that, um, which is quite fun. Um, so that's not entirely auditing, right? That's just like white hat hacking and like doing like running security fuzzing on other people's stuff. Is that like, where, yeah, where's, well, what's the, is that, what's the, where's, where's the much. line delineating the two? I mean, that's a good one. So I, I would say, I mean, auditing is, um, is it's used a lot in, in um, this space. And I think it refers to like an engagement is in like a kind of someone come, like the client comes to you and says, hello, we would please like a security review. And we say, yes, you know, here's, here's the scope of it. It's like over this many days, this is the resources. Um, and then we agree, we perform this kind of, we call them time boxed reviews. Um, give them an analysis of what we found, and then we kind of move on. That's that's probably what I would call auditing. There's a few mm -hmm. different structures to it, but it's like ultimately like a professional services contract. Um, okay. Then and Sigma like Prime a, does do that, right, for projects? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's about okay. half of the business at least. Okay. Um, so, and then when it comes to white hat hacking, I would say that that's a little bit more um, like there's a guy in Ethereum called Samsung who... Um, has just found all of these um, vulnerabilities in smart contracts, and um, they, I think, I think, I think, it's, I think it's a he. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll go with they. So they, um, uh, just kind of in their spare time, just go and analyze contracts, um, and and then like you know find a vulnerability and then you know report it um, respectfully and you know tell them, give them the heads up, and then release it over time. Um, so that's like a, a type of white hack, I guess, hacking, mm -hmm. it's just go, we call it like bounty hunting. Um, yeah. so in, he, they may or may not get a bounty for it. And then there's like the other type of white hat hacking, which would be, I don't know if you're familiar with the DAO hack. It happened in, in Ethereum a while ago. I mean, yeah. I I'm vaguely aware of it, but yeah, but you can, you can bring it back up and then just kind of TLDR it. Yeah. So that was, there was a big thing called the DAO in Ethereum. I forget which year it was, maybe it was in 16 or 17 or something. Um, and it was like big smart contract, biggest smart contract ever. It was going to be like this robot venture capital firm, you know, really fun. Everybody just dove into it against kind of recommendations of, of everyone. Everyone just piled in. Uh, and then it was pretty early in the days of smart contract development. Um, still is really, uh, back then. And there was a new class of bug that no one had ever considered before. It's called a re-entrancy. Basically you call to another contract, you can call back and you can break all these assumptions about, um, about the, like how, what the program's doing. So. Anyway, the, the, it ran for a bit, maybe a few months or something. Um, and then uh, a black hat hacker, so a bad guy, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, found found a vulnerability and found out that they could just slowly leak money out of it. Um, and then everyone was like, oh my God, you know, it's terrible. We're all going to lose our money. So a bunch of chaos. And then 
this is what we call the white hat hackers, they came along and said, you know, what we'll do is we'll, we'll pull the same attack because, you know, it's not limited to one person. We'll start executing the same t attack in parallel and we'll drain out into this, like into our own wallets or to a smart contract. Um, and then what we'll do is, you know, kind of once this is all over and settled down, then we'll figure out a way to distribute that money equally back to the people's shares. So that was like... We, <laughs> so you have a black hat got... hacker and a white hat hacker simultaneously draining the Dow funds? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's like, that's the kind of, that was a real like classic kind of white hat move. It's like you're coming in there and doing a bit of hacking, but doing it for the, doing it for, you know, for the, the good. greater good. Yeah, that's right. Interesting. So like, I'm curious when you, when you kind of glossed over the re-entrancy um, bug, is that because the, uh, the smart contracts were not permissioned properly or is it like for some other reason? Well, I mean, like all good bugs, it's also a feature. Um, <laughs> it's also so... a feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was a thing where you can um, so like you, you have a smart contract and then you can mm -hmm. you can call out to another one and say, okay, you know, you you start um, you do some some stuff for me, and then when you're done, you know, come back to me. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what we didn't realize then was that um, so you got smart contract A, it calls out the smart contract B, right? Mm -hmm. So A is the DAO um so a would it would like i maybe do some things like compute some stuff and say like okay i have an idea of the state of the world now and i'll call mm -hmm. out to this guy tell him to do something based on that and then b does a bunch of stuff and then it comes back and then a uh, and reports back to it and then a carries on um and the problem here was that it carries on some of these assumptions it made beforehand mm -hmm. um and then and, and carries them through but the problem is that we have no idea what contract B does, and it can in fact go and interact back with this smart contract A by you know some other method and change it. So what we have mm. is like smart contract A is cruising along and goes, okay, I have an idea of the state of the world, calls out to this other smart contract, which calls back to it, changes its state of the world, and then the DAO never goes and rechecks those things before. Um, so Hmm. Yeah, which is which is pretty bad. So like one of the classic ones would be like, you know, if you want to transfer tokens out, so I'd be like, all right, my code is like, um, does the person have enough tokens? Okay, then like send them the tokens with in a way that I can that that, that it can run code if it wants to, and then after that's done, um, re reduce its balance. The problem mm -hmm. with that is that you can go like, does it have enough balance? Yeah, okay, then call it out. What it'll do is it'll call to 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 pull the funds from you again. And then, mm -hmm. then because you haven't run that code to decrement the balance, you don't know it's had less balance and it starts this loop. Um, oh, it pulls okay. up all this stuff and then, then, it, then it disappears. That's roughly the DAO hack. So um, I see. the white hat hacker came along and did the same thing, um, but, but distributed the funds. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, so, so you've been around for the history of Ethereum and probably a little bit before that too, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Just being, <laughs> getting more and more into it. Definitely around for the history of F2 being there. Bit of, a, bit of an OG in that, in that sense, I guess. Um, but yeah, being, being pretty into it. So where do you um, see where do you see the... Because um, I assume Sigma Prime will probably be a, a big player in this space beyond code auditing and beyond doing ETH implementations. Do you, do you see... Um, do you see the intersection of insurance uh decentralized insurance coming and kind of tapping the shoulder of people who do code audits and being like uh can you guys improve the way that we audit ourselves our audit our own projects internally and kind of like you know expand the ecosystem by kind of leaning on you guys yeah i suspect so we um yeah i imagine once that people start um like the big kind of re like regulatory people start getting involved and and not really have some interest in the um in auditors, um, in determining risks and and um, vetting people, I just hope that they. Um, I feel like, you know, that, that that kind of stuff is it's not like audits are definitely happening a lot now. Like we're just booked out. Um, like a lot of contracts, most I would say most projects are getting audits before they start. Um, but there's not a whole lot of um, you know like big players like say a bank coming along and saying like you know I want to I want to double check that this is sure. I'm just hoping that. That when they do do that, they're gonna they're gonna pick up. Um, I guess people like us work with uh, people that have been in the space for a long time, um, instead of kind of you know like going to their traditional supplier and saying, "Hey, you should skill up in this." Technology. Mike Ernst and Young, <laughs> let's see yeah, what you guys yeah. can do. And it's like, oh, <laughs> I don't know yeah, about that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because it takes it's it's just such a different um, 
such a different computing space, um, smart contracts, such a different set of problems that you encounter to typical um, programming like you do. There, there's some similarities there, but it's just the, the way of thinking is, is very different in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, so I'm hoping that they'll, when these big players come along, they will, they will go to experienced firms instead of just, you know, like maintaining their existing corporate supplier networks or whatever they would call it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. What, what, in your, in your own words or in your own experience, what makes for a good quality audit? Does it have to be, can it be purely qualitative or should it be, you know, some mixture of qualitative and um, code based in terms of the audit itself? Mm, well, I think definitely something that's, I think, important for, for most um, audits is that people get in there and write a bunch of tests. They start, they start using it. So someone, someone really needs to spin up the contract and then start, you know, submitting transactions to it um, and trying to get, uh, I would say, get across all of the lines of code, try and execute every line of code and test their assumptions. Um, so one of the things that we do sometimes is we'll, um, so like going back to that spec and implementation thing again, mm -hmm. um, one of the good precursors to an audit is a good specification. So every now and then we get someone, um, will come along and just have a smart contract and say, can you please audit my smart contract? And, you know, we, without a specification to reference against, it's like, oh yeah, you know, it does everything that it, it, it defines itself. So it's perfect. Um, but when we have a specification to say like, does this smart contract do exactly what this specification says? Um, and is, is, is it clear the link between the two, not only if there's, if there's obvious break, but is there ambiguities where, where, you know, like gray grayness where we can start to bend things. Um, mm -hmm. so once we have specification and the implementation, um, one of the things we'll do is get someone to, um, go through the code, use the smart contract, exercise it, um, without having read the, uh, specification. And then we'll have someone else might come along and they'll do it, spend a lot of time reading the specification and probably, and then a bit of time playing around with the implementation. And then we kind of put these two people together. Uh, and then it's quite good because the person who hasn't read the specifications, they're not really tainted by it. Um, so the, the person that's running the spec will be like, you know, and it does this. And then the person who hasn't read the spec is like, wait, I, I don't think it does that. I, I've never heard of that before. Um, so that's, that's a good way to, to, to try and find things. Um, we also find that using tools is pretty helpful as well. So that's, that's the kind of manual review part where people sit down and look at it. Um, mm -hmm. And then another part, which is quite helpful is running tools across it. So um, like trailer bits have a bunch of cool static analyzers. Um, there's a whole, whole bunch out there. Fuzzing is another type of tool analysis tool. So we get a program to sit down there and try and run through it, look for common um, patterns, programming patterns that are, that are flagged as bad. And also try and you know throw some random inputs at it and see see how how it handles errors. Um, that's like another I think important part to a, to a contract review. You can find a lot of things there that um, that you might miss just as a person reading. You can find them very cheaply and easily as well. Um, so I think a combination of the the human manual review and yeah. um, and then the, the automated tooling is is probably like a real fundamental for for a good review going through. Fair enough. Is it important um, in, in terms of like the, the soft or qualitative review, is it important to um, look at the development team and to like note that they do have some experience in the space and they're not just, you know, completely new, just wham, bam, throwing something together, copy pasting? Yeah, yeah, that can help. We don't tend to go too deeply into the developers. We'll have a look and see who they are. We generally mm -hmm. find it out during the engagement by chatting to them to see whether like to get you get a feel for their for how good they are um so it'd be like you know sometimes you might get it, it kind of it doesn't really hugely dictate it but it, it does a little bit like if you know if you got a bunch of just like hardcore contract developers you know being the game built really big things you you, you might like i don't know start to look for a different type of class because it's probably going to be a little bit more contracts you'd be like looking at um like in the math like the kind of tricky areas of it um spending a lot of time there um, and then especially if they're developed, if they're, um, well experienced, they've probably run a lot of the tools, so well-known tools across it. So you don't really need to spend time, like we will do it. It's not, you know, not, not a huge focus. Then on the other hand, if you get, you know, people that are, um, uh, clearly quite new, um, demonstrating not really much of an understanding, then you really need to kind of start, you know, like at the basics and just try and pick out the, um, the, the low, low level kind of really important ones. 
Um, because I guess ultimately with these these engagements, they're they're time box. So you gotta gotta choose where to spend your, spend your um spend your hours. So it's probably is that how I think. the audits primarily run? They they say uh, we plan on launching uh, hot devil finance. I don't know uh, in in two weeks or no, not that's just too short. Maybe two months, right? And then they they contract uh, out the auditing to Sigma Prime and. Um, what's the turnaround time looking like? Like, is it long enough? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say a lot of the time, a lot of the time we get people who, I guess the, the new players will come along and say, you know, we're launching in two weeks or something. And they say, no, 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 it's not time. Um, so you guys do like kind of push back in terms of timelines. Like we need more time to provide an adequate, adequate uh, audit. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the okay. things I understand with, with audits as well is that so we, we generally, we've, we've strayed away from calling them audits, but the, the industry loves it. So we, we tend to do it anyway. Um, what because, would you guys prefer to call them? Well, security reviews is what we call them. So one, okay. one of the guys, um, so Medi comes from a, like a corporate background in this stuff and they were never allowed to call stuff audits because audits, at least in the professional services world, it assumes that you have, like, so you can do a tax audit, right? Because um, the, the, the rules of tax are set out and, and you can come along and say, you know, this adheres like to the rules of the, the tax system wherever you are, um, and that you can you can pretty easily say that. Whereas with like a piece of software or a smart contract, it's there's no set of there's well no 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 set of rules. It can do anything, and that's kind of the idea of programming languages. So we can't come along and say you know yes this thing is safe or yes this thing adheres to this okay. set out policy because it doesn't exist. So um, so audit is like a legally loaded term. Yeah, coming that's from right. the old system okay yeah so if you were like one of the big four consulting terms and you said like you know here's here's your order you'd probably have like you know some bloke from legal catching the elevator down to to give you wrapping across the knuckles um so we 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 tend to say security reviews um something else that's important as well to understand is that these smart contracts and computer software they're so complicated um that it's really, you really can't say that a piece of software is safe or it is mm -hmm. secure. Um, and you should be really cautious of anyone that does that um, just because there's so much going on, so many moving parts. Um, and there's also, like, you know, with the DAO, there was a whole new class of attack that no one had considered before until that point. Um, so there's things that, like, we're still early, there's still things that we haven't considered or can't, aren't able to consider yet. So um, when we do these security reviews, um, how we structure it is we say, you know, we, 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 we've looked at the, 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 the smart contract, like here's the risk and complexity factors. Um, we've allocated this amount of time to it. Um, and then we'll give you an analysis of what we found after that. Um, so what we're doing is we're saying, you know, we're not saying, okay, yeah, this, this, this is, this is safe. Like rubber stamp, never break. Uh, what yeah. we're saying is, you know, we, we've like kind of, we've allocated time to it. We spent the time on it. Here's the things we found. Here's the recommendations we have for moving forward. And then that's, you know, that's, that's a point of information that you can use uh, when you're deciding whether you should put your funds in, into it or not. Hmm. I saw yeah. on, um, yeah, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just, I was just going to say that um, I saw that when you, when you say that uh, you've kind of provably to some degree shown that, that uh, a project is, I mean, it's it's uh it has this level of risk I, I i don't know if you can really say anything is risk-free like you were saying um but uh when i see like projects pop up on like binance's smart chain which is i guess like a complete copy of ethereum right mm. um i see that like there's just just people dumping money into new projects just immediately almost what do you think about that well i mean i guess it's a strategy for them i know it you know, this kind of like really uh, high risk, not well thought out speculative investment is not something that I'm a huge fan of. Um, I, think I saw the 2008 GFC, it seems like that, that was kind of what went down there. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure that that's really a productive thing for us to be doing um, or whether it's, um, you know, if it, if, if it's a good thing. So I'm, I'm generally not keen for that type of thing, but I, I can acknowledge that, you know, perhaps these people 
like, you know, maybe if you have, you know, like several million dollars or tens, hundreds of million dollars and you can just like pile into this smart contract and, and like, if it, if it, it's, if it's a giant piece of crap and it crashes and takes all your money, if that's part of your risk model and I can see how that might be a profitable thing for them to do. Um, so I guess, I mean, you know, the, uh, I would hope that people that are, you know, diving into these big contracts have considered the risks that, that they're taking. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they consider and accept those, then that would be good. Um, but then when it comes to like your everyday, you know, the old ma and pa investors, which we probably don't see so much in crypto, maybe maybe give it like five or ten years and, <laughs> and the crypto people will be having kids. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that, that's who it would concern for me. It's just the people that don't really understand the risk and they hop in and, and it's not good. So yeah, I think for me generally, not a fan of that. Um, I, I generally stay pretty clear. I don't really follow the Binance stuff. I stay clear of that kind of, like I was involved in the 2017 ICO rush. So, you know, I, I've, I've, <laughs> you, I've, you know I've what that's like. It. Yeah. I've seen the piles of bodies. I've seen, I've seen all that. The piles stuff. of bodies. I like, I, used to, <laughs> yeah. I call them brick layers. Yeah. I used yeah, to be so, one of them. Yeah. 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 I was, I was as well. So now, um, yeah, no, I've got my little F, F2 bubble and I live in there and live in the protocol with all the researchers and it's, it's, it's nice in there. That's good. Hmm. All right. So uh, where do you want to go with this? Do you want to talk about like maybe your dreams of what where Sigma Prime can be, can situate itself and what kind of projects you'd like to work on in the future within, you know, the ETH2 bubble? Yeah, totally. So I guess, I mean, ETH2 is... It's charging along. So we we launched the the beacon chain. So that's so how Ethereum structured its change over to proof of stake and sharding is we launched uh, the beacon chain, so a separate chain which is disconnected from the current Ethereum chain. So it's kind of like you know you got like building a highway next, to, like a bigger highway next to another highway. So the current Ethereum is like you know like a nice little one way highway cruising along somewhere. Uh, and then we've built this you know real big um, like big highway next to it F2. Um, yeah, it's got we've got proof of stake working and validated. It's like strong. It's supporting itself, um, and then we're kind of in the process of just diverting the traffic onto it. So that kind of diversion of all the traffic from existing Ethereum to the new one, uh, we call that the merge. So that's something we're working on now. We've got um, like literally this week, we can expect to see I think a multi-client um, test net where we have where we demonstrate moving the execution capacity of, of Ethereum one over to Ethereum two. So mm-hmm. that's something that I'm working on now. Um, that means a lot to me. Uh, I think it means a lot to Sigma Prime as well. Um, that'll mean deprecating the proof of work chain. Mm-hmm. Um, this is something that, that I've been keen to do for a while. Um, so that's, that's I guess, really exciting for me, Sigma Prime and, and Ethereum to see, to, to see that. And I guess, I mean, seeing us make such a huge impact uh, in Ethereum and, and being, you know, kind of the, having our code being one of the things that, and every time you do a transaction, it runs to make sure that, that everyone agrees on it. It's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, so I think the timeline for that is probably maybe end of this year, early next year. Um, these timelines always tend to blow out um, in my experience. So um, like you, you can know what we're, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to make it happen end of this year, probably next year. Um, mm-hmm. But historically, things have gone a bit longer. Mm-hmm. Um, so then what we've done after that is we've kind of, We've, we've got the same Ethereum we had before, same transaction capacity, same single core machine. Now we've moved it over to proof of stake. So we've, we've mm-hmm. the miners, we've ditched the energy usage. Um, and then after that, our next big goal is to implement sharding. So that's where we say, you know, the we implement, you know, additional versions of Ethereum and allow mm-hmm. them to all run together. Um, this thing is probably like, you know, late next year we're looking at, maybe the year after. Um, and it tends to be that we, we've seen the sharding vision refined a few times. Like the original one we had was basically, you know, just what the Ethereum we have now, but just many of them and they link together somehow. Uh, and then over time, as we've seen like layer two, like ZK rollup chains, um, new technology, new cryptography come along. Um, the vision that has changed a bit to be less like, you know, just, just like lots more of what we have now to be like, okay, maybe. Um, we start to build things so that they're lighter, but very well suited to these DK rollup chains so that you can kind of, that Ethereum is less opinionated about 
um, the transactions and the accounts and stuff like that, uh, and is more about like a layer for facilitating um, you know, like consensus and um, and retention of data about blockchains. Um, so that's no, that, that's coming along as well. So sorry. The whole the whole zk rollup thing. Is there any way you can like simplify that and explain it to me? Oh yeah. So this is I don't spend a whole lot of time and I don't have one in the like up my sleeve. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea is that you. So Ethereum now, you kind of everything like the transaction, the the state before, the state after, um, mm -hmm. all the data you send in the transaction is kept in the chain or in 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 the, like your Ethereum node. So let's just say Geth, like it, it, it knows of all of this stuff, um, the transaction. It ha probably has to store it in some way. Um, whereas when it comes to a zk rollup, the idea of a zk rollup is that. Um, it's a fancy new cryptographic system. I won't go into it. It takes a while. It's pretty complicated. Um, mm -hmm. But it allows you to do basically, so it's called like a zero knowledge proof. So the idea is what we can do is we can say in Geth, for instance, the, the blockchain or Bitcoin core, we only store just um, hashes, like hashes and, and a little bit of data instead of the whole transaction and everything that happens, just like hashes and little bits. And then something just updates those hashes every now and then. So from its perspective it's just a um just a bunch of hashes just all probably linked together and then we have another program which is kind of the like almost another little sub client um which manages the zk uh, rollout part of it and then what we can do is we can use the f chain the consensus to agree on you know what is the state of this little zk rollout subsystem and just put like a little snapshot of it up there mm -hmm. and then part of the cryptographic magic of zk rollups is that we can form these really succinct, beautiful proofs to say that, you know, um, just with this little bit of information on the main chain and some knowledge of this system, we can say that, you know, um, this is the account balance of this person. Um, and then what we can do is we can transact inside this little subsystem really quickly, really fast, uh, and then just do periodic slow updates to the main chain um, to kind of like keep a solid history. So it's, I guess it's like a little bit like a, um, like a plasma kind of thing, you know, it's like a, a little subsystem that can transact really quickly with a very different fee or account model. Uh, and then it kind of periodically pushes updates to the main chain. Um, so it can run without the history of the whole blockchain then. Uh, so it runs yeah, prune? It can. Or yeah, is it that? Only... Yeah, you can do lots of things with it. But I guess from its little subsystem view, it only really needs to know the history of itself. Um, and then you kind of use, like, knowing the history of itself, you reference it against the big heavy main chain with all the validators um, and ensure that, that everyone agrees upon it. Um, and yeah, so that, that's the nice thing is it doesn't need to know the, the whole state so it can be smaller. And the other nice thing as well is that it doesn't need to wait. It can have much quicker blocks. So you can have transactions that are confirmed much quicker um, things like this. But generally the trade-off with that is you change the, you, you'll change the trust model a little bit in the system. Um, so that you're, you're trusting the system and not necessarily providing uh, validation. Yeah. So a lot of these things have like systems where you like, you know, you can transact really fast, but mm -hmm. it's possible that invalid transactions might be included and it's the job of someone to, to be a watchkeeper and flag when these things happen. So that's, that's not something that happens on Bitcoin and Ethereum now. Like there's, there's never any invalid transaction in there. It's just it's because we, we thoroughly and heavily check every single transaction. There's never mm -hmm. any valid one, so you don't need anyone to watch. Whereas with these kind of layer two solutions, sometimes they're because they're, they're so quick, we kind of rely on someone else just, just double checking them. Um, so yeah, there's like the, kind of the changes in the trust model there. But F2 is, is really moving towards a, a world where we can support these layer two solutions because they're going like super fast. We have a stable coin, um, uh, like a bunch of stable coins now running on, um, on layer two solutions. Like, I don't know if you know Gitcoin, um, I know. Is that the one that uh, that you use for donations to the the for Gitcoin grants? Is yeah, that that's for... right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you can like send money to developers and heaps of stuff for grants. That all happens on a zk chain now. Um, so like we, we get a bunch of grants and they're all you know like layer two transactions. We're getting you know real, and we and we turn that into you know we we, we go and exchange that for real money. To, you know, buy milk and with it. Um, so it's actually, it's actually happening out there and it's really cool to see. So yeah, that's going to be one of the future goals of Ethereum too, is just to, to be like really, um, to try and be lightweight, um, and to provide as many features for these, these 
layer two solutions as we can. So, yeah, I guess for Sigma Prime, just um, the Ethereum two side of it, just moving on that that roadmap is um, is really where we're at. Um, we want to also keep improving our client. We keep so there's in F2, we got validators, they perform duties and get rewards based on how well they performed them. So we're also trying to figure out um, ways to make sure we can do our duties as best as possible, never miss anything, ensure maximum rewards and maximum chain health. Um, so yeah, that's, that's I guess, where we're traveling from the, the Sigma Prime and Lighthouse front uh, at the moment. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you some of our signature questions uh, as we wrap up here. I'm going to ask you the first one, which is, is what you do actually hard? Uh, I guess I find it pretty hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah. I would, I would say. <laughs> yeah. I Seems mean, so. <laughs> yeah. It's not, I mean, I know when I, when I wasn't doing this kind of stuff, I, I looked up and I thought, wow, these people that are, you know, like, you know, all these client devs, they must be just like these gods of people that are just on another realm. That's that's not the case. Um, it's just every everyone's just like normal people, just trying to make it through. Um, but I would say it's hard. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, and then our uh, second question is: uh, in ten words or less, can you describe and then Bitcoin, blockchain, whatever you want to do, like uh, NFTs? We we never touched upon that, but that's fair game. Oh yeah. So describe one one of those in one of those three in ten words or less. Oh god, I, I don't do the um, <laughs> n words or less questions. I don't I don't have a, a counter in my head. Um, Just give it a whirl, and then we can condense it down. All right, I'll go with uh, Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Let's say. A brand new global computing platform. Perfect. Six. Not, 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 not impressed with that one. That's probably on someone's website already. But, oh, well. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. But uh, I appreciate your time with us, Paul. Thank you for uh, explaining exactly what you do and where you came from in the space. And uh, yeah, I hope Sigma Prime is uh, going to be. It's, I'm I'm sure it's going to be set to be one of the leviathans in this space in terms of Ethereum development. So, so awesome! Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It was, it was great to chat. Awesome.